All right, so today I want to talk about two things. One, I want to talk about the Raytheon homework assignment. And two, I'll call it lecture note six. We're going to talk about, <clears throat> um, in lecture note six, we are going to talk about the uh, multiples part of the analysis, which we didn't get to finish last week. So <clears throat> let's talk about Raytheon. So this is a fixed version of the Raytheon model. Okay, So I, I want to give you a little context to the Raytheon homework assignment I just gave you. So last semester, one of the industries that we chose was defense and aerospace. And one of the teams did Raytheon. And unfortunately, they struggled with an unbalanced CFI. right? Because if you have an unbalanced CFI, you have a flawed model. So I thought it would be a good learning opportunity for us to discuss that as a homework assignment. So for your purposes, you did the bull, the bear, the as is, the target using the broken model. And I will post in the next day or so a fixed model which fixes the CFI. All right. So let's talk about specifically. <clears throat> if you looked at the model that was broken, the CFI is going to be the result of the TII and the TFI. What was broken? The TII or the TFI? It was the TFI, which basically means there's a problem with the balance sheet. Okay. So the idea and the metaphor I like to use is the Lego example. So we took a Lego toy, we ripped it apart, we put it back together as something else. But the problem is there's a Lego on the floor. So there's an account on the balance sheet that wasn't being carried through and that was causing the unbalanced TFI and the unbalanced CFI and the flaw in our model. Okay. By the way, <clears throat> in the valuation, forecast years 2016 forward balanced. Why did they balance? Why was the flaw in the historical years and not the future years? Why did it get quote unquote fixed? Yeah. Because your forecasting model Well, it's, it's not just that it wasn't taking the model into account. We did something to the balance sheet. Yeah. That's right. We actually made the balance sheet balance, so we plugged with excess cash. So if there was a hole, we kind of filled it. So the deal is that we actually were carrying forward a flawed model that balanced <clears throat> because we plugged the future forecast years to balance. All right. But nonetheless, the historical years were a flaw. All right. Here's the reason why I want to mention this to you. <clears throat> is what was the flaw? Well, generally, the flaws that we've come up with come about in one of two ways. But primarily, and you can see this on the model data tab, but we're exporting raw fields from Bloomberg, and we're putting them into a model to create a standardized income statement and balance sheet. <clears throat> if a company's accountants report on a company's financial statement a field that is not in one of these exported fields, then we're not going to have the correct balance sheet and we're not going to have the correct information. And that was the case with Raytheon, is that Raytheon had a non-standard item on their balance sheet. right? And it wasn't even an item that other defense and aerospace companies had. It was something that the Raytheon accountants put on there that nobody else had, even in their industry. And so, essentially, I didn't pick it up when I was trying to go through the Bloomberg standardized fields and it would be non-standard and Bloomberg doesn't try and standardize the fields anymore. So basically we were missing something. So what we'd have to do is we'd have to go through and we'd have to painstakingly figure out what we were missing. And that was what we ran into last semester. Okay? And specifically, <clears throat> I had one of the TAs write it up because I thought it was a good exercise. But last semester, we had three companies that had three problems out of the 27 group projects that had non-balancing CFIs. Okay, So I don't think it, it's a high probability of happening to your team. But if it does happen to your team, what I'm telling you is very quickly, if your CFI doesn't balance, you know by looking at the TII or TFI whether it's the income statement or balance sheet, and I, what's going to happen is just we're missing an account. Okay, 
So in, in Raytheon's case, what we were missing is there was an account called unbilled revenues, which was a current asset, and it wasn't being picked up by our balance sheet model. Okay, And so basically, in order to fix it, what we have to do is we have to get the unbilled revenue, we have to put it into the model exports, we have to adjust the model export field, we have to then add it to the balance sheet, add it to the TFI, to add it to the CFI. And until we do, we won't get it fixed. So here's the thing. This model, which is part of my solution, has a balanced CFI for Raytheon because we fixed this model after the team had the problem, and this is the fixed model. I will post the fixed model for you guys to see. Okay, But here's the thing. The model that you turned in, unless anybody went the extra effort to figure out why it didn't balance and fixed it, which I don't think anybody did, but assuming you didn't, then you turned in a broken model. Okay, And here's why this is important is because in the as-is valuation, we were valuing Raytheon to what? 138. 138. If you took those same exact assumptions and you put it into the fixed model, you would have gotten a share price of 110. And the reason why <clears throat> is because you would have had the wrong working capital in your broken model because you would have missed that investment in the current assets and you would have overrepresented the cash flow because you would have underrepresented gross investments in the future. And the reason why you would have done that is because in the future, the model solved for it by putting the plug into excess cash, which was a non-operating asset, as opposed to working capital, which would have been an operating asset. And the difference in the valuation is $28 a share, right? with the exact same assumptions. right? So this is the reason why I wanted to demonstrate this. Because throughout the semester, I said that there was an advantage to doing the approach of balancing the statements. And this is an illustration of that advantage. Because without balancing the statements, which almost nobody does, you would not have known that you had a flawed free cash flow. And your free cash flow valuation would have come up with a share price of 138. When the reality is that those assumptions, because they were flawed, and they were missing a working capital item that was treated as cash, not working capital, would have changed the valuation by about 15%. And you wouldn't even known you made a mistake. And to be honest with you, if you'd presented this to Raytheon, they probably wouldn't even known that you had made the mistake. You would have just mispriced the company. And this is why we do the balancing of the statements. Right? I'm not saying we can't make mistakes. But it's going to more clearly highlight that we're missing something by balancing the statements, that if we don't balance the statements, people can just miss in the real world. And it can be substantial depending on the account. And it just so happened to be substantial in the case of this particular company. Right? And so to be honest with you, the reason why I wanted you to go through the exercise is right here. Because what you clearly see is I wanted to show you with the exact same assumptions we get a delta of about $28 a share, plus or minus a little bit, depending on your assumptions, but somewhere around $28 a share using the same assumptions because of the classification of working, a working capital item, an operating item, which is going to be valued through the continuing value formula, versus an excess cash item, which is non-operating, because it would have plugged it by treating it as cash, not as a working capital, because it would have misrepresented the investment and it would have shown you more cash, so they would have less investment in more cash, which is why you got the higher stock price. And that would have been a real flaw that you otherwise would have missed. Okay? Yes? Yeah, one of the TA sent out message and said that if you copy and pasted the balance sheet formula for the, for, for the forecast back to the historical years, it balances it, but it's not right. But the problem with doing that, and I'm just saying, it would balance it. Just be a plug. 
but we would have just plugged the historical years. And which leads to generally in the past, and I did not go over the statement originally when we built the model, there's a tab here called change in equity. Okay? Because in the past, as we've been using this model historically in this class, where we have found unbound C CFIs actually comes from a second area. So Raytheon was actually interesting because they were a unique case. And that's why I thought it'd be interesting to do in this class, just because it illustrates the point. But most of the time, the problems occur because of something called AOCI. I got some accountants in the room, accounting majors. What does a AOCI stand for? What is AOCI? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's other comprehensive income. So <clears throat> here is the, I'll, I'll just simplify it. Here's the conceptual challenge. Is that generally we use three accounting statements. There's the balance sheet, there's the income statement, there's the gap statement of cash flow. And if you think about a balance sheet, a balance sheet is a snapshot statement. And what explains the changes of the two balance sheets is the income statement. So balance sheet, income statement, new balance sheet. And the income statement gives you the change between the two balance sheets. Right? And that's what typically happens. Unfortunately, AOCI becomes a problem because AOCI adjustments are adjustments that accountants are now making to the balance sheet that do not show up on the income statements. Well, that becomes a problem because our financial model assumes that the income statement explains the changes in the balance sheet. But if there's a change in the balance sheet that's not hitting the income statement, well, that's where we have a problem. And that's where the little used statement number four comes into play. So there's another gap statement that very few people talk about, which is the statement, what's it, what's it called? The change in equity statement? Or shareholders' equity, or I don't even statement know the damn name. Shareholders' is. equity, I think. Yeah, the statement of shareholders' equity, and so what they do is they put the change on that statement, all right? So that's how they explain they made the change. But the problem is because it doesn't hit the income statement, then the income statement doesn't explain the two years, and our model is based on the income statement explaining the change in the two years. So what I did, and I didn't have you do this because this gets really complicated dealing with this fourth statement is I created this tab in the model called change in equity. Because what I wanted to look at was to see whether there were other adjustments to equity that the accountants were making for companies historically that weren't flowing through the income statement that I needed to plug into the model in order to get it to balance. All right? But here's the thing. When you make a change to equity, it doesn't affect cash flow. Because all you're doing is just wiping out or adding in to equity. Right? You're not changing cash. So therefore, they don't really affect the valuations. And here's the thing. In the forecast, if you remember, we said that any adjustments for accounting reasons, we weren't going to forecast. They were always going to be zero because we couldn't forecast what accounting adjustments were. And to be honest with you, they have no cash impacts. So we didn't worry about it. So that's why it was okay to A, not forecast them, and B, to use excess cash as a plug, and it wouldn't cause a flaw. If Raytheon historically had made equity adjustments and that's what was causing their balance sheet to unbalance, then what the TA told you would have actually worked and it wouldn't have affected the valuation because it wouldn't have affected the cash flow. Raytheon is in a unique case because historically what we're missing there is not an equity adjustment. What we're missing is an actual working capital number which does affect operating cash flows which is why the balance sheet would have balanced historically, but it would put the wrong stuff in the wrong categories. So there's two types of things that are going to happen to our models. And this won't affect 95% of us. So 95% of the time, we don't get into these issues. But when you're building a model, even in the real world, and you're trying to foot it, I'll just tell you these are the two things you're going to run across. Number one, there's an item on the balance sheet that's missing that you just didn't pick up and you got to make sure that you account for everything, right? And so, like I said, when you were going through the first part of the semester and you're going into the midterm, and I was talking to you about counting ones and twos and threes and fours and balancing everything, and you hated that, this is why you do it, right? 
Process part number two, picking up equity adjustments that are not on the balance sheet. So there's are two sources of error. Source of error number one is you're just missing something from your data feed. Data point number two is you're missing something because it's not even on your data feed and it's just this direct adjustment accounts are making. You gotta account for that. So as I said, the second one is just annoying and it's easily solvable, but you gotta go back and you gotta solve for it. And to some degree, the model has mostly solved for it, but I can't tell you that there's not some other adjustment that the accounts won't come up with that Bloomberg is missing off of its standard fields and then we'll have to add it in. Okay, and so that's essentially what you need to do. You need to add it in as a field and you need to hook it up to your model. Now, I'm not going to make you redo your models. I'm going to give you a solution which has it added in and correctly accounted for in Raytheon. But as I said, the whole point of your assignment was to kind of, one, practice the process, and two, highlight this as a teaching issue. So let's go back to the models themselves. So <clears throat> in terms of the buy-sell holds for Raytheon, based, based on the previous classes, you probably got numbers that look somewhere around, because people were saying they were kind of running it out, at around 4.4% growth, about similar margins, and about a 28% tax rate, and that got you very close to the $138 stock price. Right Now again, on this screen, it's going to look like a different stock price, because this is the fixed model, which correctly accounts for the working capital going forward. The other one didn't. So just let's assume that these are the same for the time being. So buy, sell, hold. All right, you said buy for Raytheon. Mm -hmm. So when you did your target, what did you change for the buy versus the as is? Right. So what I did is, you know, just because one analyst would be a bear and the other would be a bull, okay. it doesn't mean that the bear has to be, or like that he has to be equally as bullish as the bear and as bearish. Or be Can somebody close that door? Right. Thanks. So um, since, as we were talking about earlier, there's all this growth in like cybersecurity and Raytheon is entering into like the like the private sector mm -hmm. um, cybersecurity market. And then also I did some reading and Raytheon is one of the leading providers of like the avionics systems for the um, unmanned aerial vehicles. So I stayed within like, uh, I had a much more aggressive bull estimate than a bearish estimate because there's almost like, you know, a floor that they can hit while depending on the growth of unmanned avionics and cybersecurity, they could grow a lot more. So my target price was much closer to my, um, bull than it was to my bear. And so just give me a sense, what kind of revenue growth rates were you using for Raytheon? So for um, the bear, I was using about two and a half or three percent because I'm thinking that they're still going to have... You're positive, talking about the CVG? Yeah. Okay. Um, because they're still going to have positive growth even if, you know, those markets or those like industries don't expand as much otherwise. But for the but for the bull, I used one that was closer to five because assuming that there's this huge growth in that industry, it would, you know, since Raytheon is a leading player they could capture a lot more growth. Okay. What did you use for like the revenue growth rates for the first five years? So I used 4.4 um, for, you know what, let me pull up the bull. Oh, that's okay, just approximately. Um, yeah, so so for the revenue growth rate I used around 5.5%. Um, so five and a half. And yeah. what did you say about their EBITDA margins? For their EBITDA, um, I said that it would kind of stay within what it's been so... I had it like at 4.1 in 2018 and then steadily increasing because I'm assuming that as this industry, you know, as those subsectors mature, Raytheon is better at handling costs. Wait a minute, you said 4.1? Four, four uh, 14, I had, in like 2018, it was like 14.1 and then I had it increased by, um, you know, like 3% or 0 0.03. You're the EBITDA margin? Yeah. Okay, so you had to go down and then up. Yeah. Okay. So, so here's what's important about what he is saying whether I agree with his comments or not, is that he's linking the story of some things that are happening in the real world with a rationale for why the assumptions are changing. And this is what I want you to focus more on in the, in the group projects, is to do the research like he just did, and to say, okay, all right, Raytheon is growing in these markets, and it's this growth that they hadn't gotten before that is why I'm using 5% versus 4 or 3%. Because if you look at Raytheon historically, which has been since 2011, pretty much negative growth, mm -hmm. even the next two years of four and five should jump out at you like, all right, what are they doing differently that's giving them four or five? And then if he's saying it's going to grow even faster than five in the years thereafter, there has to be a rationale for that. And the major rationale at a high level is what I just said, which is they're getting into commercial cyber and they're getting more global. And then he added a third one, which is their avionics. 
So they're obviously the growth of drones, the growth of to some degree commercial or sorry military aircraft worldwide. Like they do the radar systems for the F-16s and the other planes. And so basically communications, all communications, gear secure communications, that's another Raytheon expertise. So that's actually helping them as they're in this bigger expanding global pie and they're now taking more of that share. And t traditionally, international governments pay more than U.S. governments for similar technologies. So they explaining have they have to play a premium because the U.S. actually does have export controls, which is one of the reasons why companies like Raytheon didn't have more historical export sales. And now it's being loosened as we are a more global world. They're taking advantage of this and going to commercial. So I say all this because that's the context for the bull. Okay, And that's what I want you to get into is to rationale so that if I'm the investor – and I'm reading your research and listening to your assumptions, it gives me more of an understanding of your point of view. <clears throat> By the way, does anybody else on the sell side for Raytheon? Anybody do a sell? Anybody do a hold? So what would be the hold? What was your hold rationale? Uh, well, Just kind of high level. Sorry? Just high level. Just high, level. high level with some numbers. Like, you don't have to give me the exact numbers, but just approximate numbers. And uh, well, just based on, I remember that my model came out to around, one, it was under 137 or 138, but it was above 130, so it's still within. So you're talking about for your target? Yeah. Yeah, so it wasn't different than the current share price? No, I mean, it was like $7 lower. Okay. And that would be the hold, exactly. But I'm mean, saying in terms of, did you have like slightly lower revenue growth rate, lower than five? Did you have similar margins? Did you change your tax rate, CVG? Uh, I had my revenue growth rate around 4%. 4%. Uh, EBITDA, I had it consistently steady around 5 to 15%. Did you change the tax rate at all? Uh, no, this I is 28 right now. Okay, and a CVG? And uh, so for the growth rate of the economy, I had over, I had less than 4% because I know that's the average growth rate for GDP in the US, but I looked up the industry average for aerospace and it was around 3%, so I figured it's over. Okay, <clears throat> but, but here's the point. What's interesting is the two points of view are really, if, you, if you're going to read between the lines, separated on the view of growth. Right, that if you're a little bit more bullish on the growth, you, you get at this margin level, you get into the buy territory. If you're a little less bullish on the growth, you get into the hold territory. All right? But in either case, both of you make assumptions that are better than what Raytheon has been doing historically. Right? So there's another subtle but very important point that I want to draw out here, which is when we value companies, and this is why I'm asking you to do an as-is, which a lot of people skip over, like a lot of the upside for Raytheon, even at the current share price of a hold, has already been baked in, right? Because you're saying that 131 or 133 or whatever price, $5 lower, 5 to $7 lower than their share price, includes growth rates that are better than what they've gotten for the last six years and includes margins that have been better than they would have generally gotten for the last six years. And that's a lower share price than today. So I only say that because... As a starting point, it's good to know that, that Raytheon's upside to be really upside has to be a lot better, not just a little bit better, because even if they do a little bit better, that's what they're already expecting. So this is where the as is helps you, because I already know they have to do 4 to 4.5% four growth just to maintain the current share price versus historically not growing at all. Because I could say, oh, they're going to start growing at 4 or 5%. They haven't been. So now's the time to buy Raytheon. No, the analysts already expect that when they're pricing them today. So to get above that, they have to think even better. But as you pointed out, there's disagreement about the analysts. Some analysts are a little bit more bearish than bullish. Mm -hmm. And if you read through the analyst reports, it's not that they don't think that the markets are there. The problem is they don't think that Raytheon can execute. right? And the bias in this industry is that these companies – Raytheon, General Dynamics, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, they sell to governments. And selling to a government customer and selling to a commercial customer is an apple and an orange. Right? Because the government is 
We are one customer telling you exactly what we want, exactly when we want it. You build it up our specifications. You don't have to deal with trying to figure out market prices. You don't have to deal with a lot of competition. You don't have to deal with putting it out there before you even know if you have a customer. Like in the commercial market, it's just a completely different way of doing business. And historically, when these defense and aerospace companies have gone into commercial markets, they've done poorly because they just do not know how to compete with the IBMs and the Deloitte's and the PWC's and the Accenture's of the world. And they just lose big when they actually try and do commercial business. So one of the challenges that Raytheon faces in the real world today is skepticism. That even though they bought this company WebSense, there's some analysts out there and investors out there that think that they're going to take that company they're going to destroy it. right? Because Raytheon doesn't know how to do this. And when they merge their entrepreneurial commercial business into the government business, they're just going to hit a culture wall and they're just not going to be able to execute. So they're not going to take WebSense and go further. They're going to take WebSense and go backwards. Now, that, I'm not saying everybody agrees with that. But that's actually what some of the more pessimistic analysts are saying. So it's not saying that cyber is not a great market. They just think they're going to screw it up. And that's why they're not as bullish. Where the, the more bullish analysts are saying, look, these guys are going to do well in a great opportunity, and they're going to do even better, and that's some upside. And that's where some of the disagreement lies. Again, I only say this because back to context. In your group projects, I want you guys to give me more context in your recommendations because that's what makes the recommendations much more powerful. And the idea is you, it, you can still have disagreement, meaning both of you, even though you had slightly different points of view, can actually get a good grade because in the real world, you can see this right on the screen, there's not two consensus about what Raytheon is going to do. <clears throat> and there are some analysts that are very bullish, which put stock price targets well into the 300s versus others which do not. So if we happen to like 230, that's not too much. Here, oh, sorry, that's Sherwin Williams. Uh, Never mind. If you're doing Sherwin Williams, the painting company, sorry. <laughs> so make sure you're actually talking about the right screen when you're making your assessments. Uh, oh, here's right then. Not 300s. Well into the high 100s. So here's like 170. Here's 160, here's 150, here's 160 versus the 136 today. So, sorry, apple and an orange. But, <clears throat> but here's the point. Nobody's got to sell on Raytheon. There's actually 14 buys. So most analysts are actually pretty bullish, which goes back to your point that they actually think they're going to do well in these markets. Right? And again, not 100% consensus, but that's what's going to play out. All right. So for purposes of this week, I do want to spend some time on multiples. So I posted lecture note six. We didn't get a chance to get to that last week, but we do have to cover it this week because this is the fourth section of your group project. So I want to talk about multiples. And what's important to understand about multiples is multiples are another way of doing valuation, but it's not disconnected from cash flow, right? Because ultimately there is one value for a company. And even if we take multiple approaches, different approaches, we still have to come up with the same price even if we change our approach, okay? Because there's only one price. There only can be one price for a company. So that's the idea, <clears throat> is that this is just rearranged equations. And so multiples are basically saying, if DCF says we put in assumptions and that leads to a, a price, a result, multiples start with the result, and in a way, we want to work backwards to figure out the assumptions, okay? So DCF is kind of a forward-working process Multiples are a reverse-looking process, but you're still getting the same answer. And this is what I mean by triangulation. We eventually want to put the two approaches together to kind of check our math, meaning we want to compare the multiples analysis with the cash flow analysis and sync them up, right? because that will give us even more insight into the valuation. So multiples analysis, also called comparables or comparables, basically says by looking at the market price for similar assets, it provides us a benchmark for valuation. And my own personal opinion is that Wall Street likes multiple analysis because you're less likely to be sued. Right? Here's why. You, you make a price target and you're wrong. You say buy and Raytheon goes south. You're dragged onto a witness stand by some corporate lawyer. Right? So you're acting on behalf of the shareholders for the class action suit. And you work for Goldman Sachs. 
and you're on the stand and the lawyer's badgering you for the questions and you say, oh, well, the reason I came up with this price target of 153 is because I used 5.5% for my growth rate and I used this long-term terminal value growth rate. Well, why'd you use that rate? Why didn't you use another rate? It's all theoretical. They can actually sue you for that? Oh, yeah. Yes, you can. They can sue you for anything. Just in the real world, you can be sued for anything. All right, so just, again, it has nothing to do with the law. It has to do with who has more money. And if you cause a big investor to lose a lot of money, then the class action lawsuit holders are more than happy to come in and represent you. So I'm just telling you, when you're on the witness stand and you're being cross-examined for how you came up with the price that turned out to be far from wrong, far from accurate, and you have to defend your assumptions, defending a theoretical DCF is really hard to do. But here's the point. If I defend a multiple analysis, I can say, hey, here's what all these other companies that are very similar were trading at, and I use the actual prices of the actual companies, the actual multiples based on those prices, to fairly value this company. Let's say you can't be sued for that too, but at least it's defensible. Where a DCF is more, <clears throat> to some degree, esoteric. Right? I'm not saying it's not real, but that's actually why Wall Street firms always do a multiples analysis in addition to the DCF, because it's more defensible. But you sync them. You sync them together. Right? So here's the thing. They're also useful not just for public companies, but they're useful for private companies. Because if I want to value a private company, I can say, oh, here's what the public companies are trading at that looks similar to this. And so I'll use that to give me a range for trading prices. Now, here's where multiples have challenges. <clears throat> Number one, they're simplistic. Right? What I mean by that is that you're collapsing the value down to one number. So we're taking a very complex valuation and we're really just oversimplifying it. But where they really have challenges is basically what drives multiples are growth and spread primarily, which you learned in the readings for the book last week. So what you need to have are similar companies that have similar growth and spread, not just in the same industry. So as an example, if I'm valuing somebody like a Twitter and a Facebook or even a Google, those are actually not comparable companies, right? Because Google this year is going to be, you can see it here on Bloomberg, Google, EEO, is going to be $72 billion in sales. And Twitter is going to be two and a half billion in sales, All right? So in a way, they're an apple and an orange. They're at different stages of their company life cycle. They're in slightly different markets. Their growth rates are going to be dramatically different, right? The products and services they sell are somewhat different. And so what I'm telling you is we will simplify and put companies together. Yet, because they're different stages, even in the same industry, it's harder to put them together. So. Google would probably be a better comparable with somebody like a Microsoft right, or a Facebook than they would with a Twitter, right? even though people might put all four companies on the same list as multiples. So one of the biggest challenges for multiples is actually coming up with a pure list. So for example, in the first class today, they had the entertainment companies. One company chose Discovery. The other company chose Disney. Do you think they're very comparable in what they do? All right, what does Disney do that Discovery may not? Theme parks. Discovery like the credit card company? Oh, no, no Discovery Discovery. like Discovery Channel. <clears throat> What's that song? Da, 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 da. I can't sing. We're doing it like it's on the Discovery Channel. I don't know. Anyways, some club <laughs> song. <I've heard> <clears throat> but Discovery Channel, like the animals and everything else out there in the wilderness. Yeah. They're based in Silver Spring, by the way. Discovery Channel, Discovery Communications. But <clears throat> they have a series of channels, by the way. But back to this. They have theme parks at Disney. What else do they have? Disney owns like a bunch of properties that make, um, you know, like different types of media. Like they own Marvel and they own Star Wars. So that's the point. They own a studio, mm -hmm. which is far different than a television network. And they have the Avengers. And they bought Lucas Films. So they have all the Star Wars stuff. They also have a cruise ship part of their business. Right? So they also do have the Disney Channel, which overlaps directly with TV. But the point is, it's really an apple and an orange, yet people will call them comparable. And so one of the biggest problems with multiple analysis, even though it sounds as simple, is figuring out what companies are truly comparable. And today's multi-business unit companies, 
it gets harder and harder to do. Every now and then, you run into something more simple, such as Home Depot Lowe's, right? That's why the book actually uses FedEx, UPS, and Home Depot and Lowe's as examples, because they're very simple, very comparable companies. Even though <clears throat> the problem is, once you go past those, tell me the next four competitors for Home Depot and Lowe's. So that's the problem. Once you go past those two, figuring out how to do more gets really, really hard to do. So this is actually the biggest challenge in multiples, is actually figuring out who is comparable. So a few more things. The steps to do a multiple analysis. Step one, figure out the list. Who needs to be on that list? Right? And this is really the most important part of the assessment because it will affect the averages, it'll affect the insight, and it'll affect <clears throat> how you view everything based on who is on that list. But then you basically pick a list, and what you want are people with similar size and similar ROIC, or similar growth rates, similar ROIC. That's the best. So it's not just the same assets in terms of the industry, but similar growth, similar spreads. Number two, forward data. All right, valuations are based on expected cash flows, so therefore we want forward multiples based on forward earnings and forward estimates, not based on historical earnings and historical numbers. Yes? So when creating a list of comparable companies, uh, would it be possible to like, break it down into units? Like, I don't know about this, for example, but like Dunkin' Donuts, instead of comparing against like, McDonald's, like, maybe Cafe, does this make you like, find specific numbers on that? Yep. <clears throat> so, and you would probably see this in Bloomberg. Uh, let's pick, let's see if GE is an example. I think even in Bloomberg, if you go to RV, you'll see that it'll show you, for example, segments. And what they'll do is they'll actually have different comparables for different segments within the company. So that would be the idea. So, for example, if I were comparing the aircraft part of GE because they make aircraft engines, then I would care about companies that might be like Rolls-Royce or others that make aircraft <laughs> engines versus if I were to compare GE with, you know, medical devices because they make the big, like, uh, what do you call those? Not the x-rays, the uh, um, MRI, machine. MRI machines. They make, the, like, big MRI-type <laughs> machines. Then I want other people to do medical imaging devices. And those types of businesses have different margins. So, exactly, I would put together different lists versus the whole firm. All right, because finding another conglomerate that does what GE does can be very, very difficult to do. So I actually do sub-segments. Now, here's the problem. In the real world, for simplicity, sometimes they do put the whole firm in because breaking it down to its pieces is a lot of work. But you got to remember that sometimes it's less comparable on a list because it is a conglomerate with some other firms that are much more specific in a certain area. All right, so... Want forward data, then we had to select them and calculate the multiples, but that's why we need a data service like a Bloomberg or a Thompson One, because we also need the forward data for these multiples. And then we will do our analytics. <clears throat> and the best practices I've already alluded to that were talked about in the book. Ideally, you want companies that have similar prospects for growth in ROIC. So it's not as much about the segments of the company that's in, but similar growth, similar returns, similar risks. Second, you want to use forward-looking estimates. Third, enterprise value multiples are more preferable because they're less subject to distortion than, say, a P-E ratio, right? And you want to be careful to adjust for non-operating items. So, again, you're going to see a distorted multiple if you're Apple and you have $230 billion of cash sitting in the bank, okay? So, basically, you got to deal with non-operating adjustments across companies for companies that have excess cash, for example, that don't have excess cash. Or somebody like a Yahoo, which is going to be distorted because they got this big stake in Alibaba, which is going to distort their PE, versus the traditional internet search engine part of Yahoo, which is actually not making money at all. So again, that's what actually makes multiples a little bit more nuanced. Multiples can also be used for private companies and for M&A. Okay? So if we go to today's Wall Street Journal... Last night, 
Well, here we go. GE is going to buy uh, Baker Hughes, right? And CenturyLink is going to buy level three. So when these transactions are announced, one of the things is how much do I pay? Well, here's another nice feature of the Bloomberg tool that you have access to. It's called MA for mergers and acquisition. Bloomberg has a mergers and acquisition database that has 34,000 deals in it. And you can see here today is the CenturyLink acquisition of level three that was announced last night. Today's the business day and it's being written about in today's Wall Street Journal. So here's the deal. Click on it. Summary of the deal announced today, expected to be completed September 2017. This is the announced and current values based on changes in payment today. It's a cash and stock deal, $26.50 a share in cash, and then some stock terms of 1.43 shares for every other share that they're doing. Uh, this is the deal timeline. These are the parties involved. This is the structure of the deal. As it comes out, it'll be filled in. This is the financing of the deal. These are the advisors. So the advisors for L3 are City and Credit Suisse. The advisors for CenturyLink are Merrill Lynch and Morgan Stanley. There's their law firms. These are the regulatory approvals and shareholder approvals that need to be done. And more importantly, these are the deal comps. So with the deal comps, the idea here is these are the multiples of similar deals that have happened for companies like L3 over time. And these are the average multiples that the deals have been paid. So one of the things I want to understand is, okay, level three is being purchased at almost 13 times EBITDA, where the average company was being purchased at closer to 11 times EBITDA. Okay, so essentially... GE or CenturyLink is paying a pretty big premium, much higher on EBITDA and EBIT than the average company that's been completed of a similar type. Now, the other side of this is this is the biggest deal that's ever been done around these deal comps because this is a $33 billion comp deal. The average deal size is about $7 billion, and the biggest one to date was in 2013 for Virgin Media. Now, these are the trading comps. So the trading comps are based on market prices today, based on prices of publicly traded assets that aren't being bought. So here's the thing. If I'm a board member, I need to justify why I'm selling my company and is the premium enough. So here is what the current companies are trading at. And right now, based on this deal, the deal premium is about 50% of EV to EBITDA and EV to EBIT versus the median of the publicly traded companies in this industry. Okay, So again, this gets back to the justification. Right? I'm actually justifying the deal based on prices, but cash flows ultimately would have to support this. And I'm actually in line with the industry PE. But nonetheless, I can look at multiples for quickly doing comparisons or comparables. And so this is actually how it's used in the real world. And I'm sure as Merrill was talking to uh, CenturyLink when they came up with the price, this was used pretty heavily in coming up with what they thought was a fair price that was justifiable to the other company in essentially a friendly deal. And then that's the thing. The advisors on the other side of Credit Suisse had to advise the board and the senior leaders over there to say, yes, this is a fair price given all of the multiples that are being paid in the marketplace. But nonetheless, another feature of Bloomberg, in fact, they have a little model feature down here so that you can actually model your own deal terms and see whether or not it's dilutive or accretive and what the impacts would be. So not part of our class, just letting you know it's there. So let's come back to what we're going to do. In this class, you're going to have to know six multiples. And these six multiples were discussed in the reading. So I'm not going to go through them right now. I'm going to assume you did the reading and you understand what they talked about with the multiples. So what I'm going to talk about today is the Bloomberg template to help us quickly get this data. So for Wednesday, 
we're going to practice in class, and then you're going to have a homework assignment. Your next homework will be basically doing a multiples assignment and a multiples assessment, and you'll need this template. So let's go ahead and create the template in Bloomberg that auto-calculates these six multiples. So we'll start with Raytheon just as a common source, and we'll go to the RV section because this is where the peer list is, and then we'll go to custom. All right. So again, here's the deal. Um, figuring out who the competitors are for the list is tough, and we're going to simplify it by assuming Bloomberg has done a good job <laughs> because they're using real-world peers and a real-world algorithm. So in this case, we're going to use the Bloomberg best fit algorithm for the whole firm, and my default is country of domicile, so this would be the U.S. region. So these are the U.S. peers for Raytheon based on the whole firm. Okay. How did you get to that screen? Sorry. RV. RV. Custom. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the next thing is I have the market cap weighted average across the top, and add column is where we add the columns for the multiples. Right. So, again, checkbox number one, we need a list of deal peers. So in this case, or list of peers, we're going to use Bloomberg to help us create the peer list. If for some reason you don't like this peer list, you can always edit it. But for now, we'll just start with the default peer list. Number two, we need forward multiples. So let's start out with the enterprise value multiples. So the first multiple is enterprise value divided by sales. As the book talked about in the reading last week, the second forward year is more normalized. So we're going to want the second forward year multiple. Okay. That's what we're going to use as the basis for the initial part of our assessment. What that means, we built the valuation model. We built out forward sales one, forward sales two. Forward year one is typically the current uncompleted year. For Raytheon, 2016. Forward year two is the next full year. In this case, 2017. Okay, So that was off of the EEO screen. So in this case... What we can do is I can actually type in add column, custom template, EV space TO sales. So EV divided by sales, EV to sales. And Bloomberg has a standardized field called EV to this year's estimated sales, EV the next year's estimated sales. EV to next year estimated sales, this year is FY1, forward year one. Next year is FY2, because Bloomberg knows that the second forward year is a very important number to a lot of analysts. They already have a default field, which takes the consensus estimates for 2000, in this case, 17, and divides it by the into, I should say, the current enterprise value. So we want EV to next year's estimated sales. And so for Raytheon, it's 1.69. For the peers, 1.55 based on this list. Next, EV to EBITDA. EV space TO space EBITDA. And again, show more matches because sometimes there's a lot of EBITDA multiples. And as we look through the list, EV to next year estimated EBITDA. So that's current enterprise value divided by second forward year EBITDA. Right? Now, I don't want to confuse you too much. So choose that field. But just as a FYI, BEST stands for Bloomberg Estimate, okay? which means consensus estimate from the analysts. What you'll notice if we did EV to BEST EBITDA, Bloomberg Consensus Estimate Database, it gives us the ability to select any period that we want. <laughs> so if I wanted to do EBITDA based on current data, or EBITDA based on three years, I could choose my own period of EBITDA to create my own multiple. So in Bloomberg, because it's very complicated, it gives you different ways to get to the same answer. So I could actually get to that field by doing EV to EBITDA, changing my period into a customized period, changing the customized period from quarterlies to in this case, 
years ago forward, and then I could do year, year plus one, year plus two, forward year one, forward year two, etc. And I can actually create that ratio. All right? We're not going to do that because Bloomberg has helped us. What we're going to do is we're going to do EV to next year's estimated EBITDA, which is the forward year two, as if I went to the other one and manually adjusted that timeline. But I just want to let you know, if you want to get more granular, Bloomberg will let you get very, very granular. Okay? Next, EV to EBIT. Third enterprise value ratio. EV to EBIT. Show more matches. EV to next year estimated EBIT. Fourth multiple. Price to earnings multiple. P slash E. Or you can do price to earnings. And you will see estimated PE next year. Next, price to book, P slash B, or price to book. Now, for the price to book multiple, we want the current one because it's the price per share divided by the book value per share. The current book value per share is the one most recent quarter. Here's the deal. Generally, analysts don't publicly forecast book value into the future. So the method is typically current price divided by current book value. Price to book. Then we have the PEG ratio, PEG. The PEG is the price to earnings multiple divided by the long-term growth rate in earnings per share. Now very clearly, the one we're going to use is the best estimated PEG ratio for next year. And what that's based on is the second forward year 2FY, you can see it right here on the screen, the second forward year PE divided by the long-term growth rate of EPS. The standard for long-term growth rate of EPS is five years. So it means the five-year growth rate in earnings per share. So the PEG ratio is the second year PE divided by the average growth in, price to, in uh, EPS over the next five years. Note that that's not the same as the CVG in our model, right? The CVG in our model is the growth in free cash flow into perpetuity. The long-term growth rate the analysts use is the growth in EPS for five years, okay? They're a complete apple and an orange, but nonetheless, that's what they use to estimate the PEG ratio. So just to help you get a sense of this, let's add a seventh column called LTG which is the best long-term growth in EPS. Okay, so here is the best estimate for long-term growth. Different fields, basically the same thing. And uh, we'll do the best LTG EPS. And we'll do it as of one day ago. So this would have been what the analyst had in the consensus database on Friday for their growth in EPS for the next five years. Because again, I can go as an analyst, I can change my growth rate or any number any time. So by using it one day ago, we're using the most current growth rate in EPS that's currently being forecast for these companies. Okay. Then you want to save this as a reusable template. Call it whatever you want. I'll call this fall 2016 and this is 2 p.m. You can call it whatever you want. I'm just doing it so I know it's by section, but this is the one I did in this section. Oops, let's see if I can create it. All right. Questions about what I just did? So make sure you save this template because it will be this template that we will analyze in our next class. And when we analyze it, just as an other thing, from the readings, what you should have read last week is the key value drivers formula 
which we've been using very heavily this semester, will be rearranged to get these multiples. So for example, this is using the key value driver formula to create a version that estimates PE multiples. So we'll use this to understand PE multiples. It's a function of these items. Net income, growth in net income, return on equity, cost of equity. Then the key value driver formula was rearranged to get the enterprise value to EBIT formula. So understanding enterprise value to EBIT is understanding the components of this formula. Tax rate, G, long-term ROIC, and WAC. Okay? And so basically, this will help us explain the enterprise value to EBIT formula. This will help us explain the enterprise value to sales formula. Key value driver rearranged to get enterprise value to sales. By the way, it was this rearranged formula, margin equals enterprise value to sales divided by enterprise value to EBIT. That's what we had previewed when we got the margin that was estimated in the valuation model. So what I'm telling you is when we do multiples analysis, we know that they're all a derivation of the enterprise value formula. So therefore, by using the formulas in the enterprise value formula, we'll get a better understanding of why the multiples are where they are and what numbers are necessary to justify those multiples. That's what the analytics will be, and that will be writing all that up and doing all that math, your next homework assignment. Okay, So just preparing us to be able to do this on Wednesday in class. So make sure on Wednesday in class, we'll need Bloomberg, we'll need this template, we'll need Excel, because we're going to use these formulas, and then we'll do the analytics. And then finally, one other thing I do want to reference is we'll make one additional adjustment to our Excel model that we created for this class in Bloomberg. And it has to do with the calculation for enterprise value. If we go to the FA screen, I'll show you what I'm talking about. FA. So we define enterprise value very specifically in this class using the Medigliani-Miller approach that McKinsey has adopted. This is the definition for enterprise value, often called total enterprise value, that is taught academically in all the other classes and is used by Wall Street and is therefore used by data services like Bloomberg and Thompson. And this is the calculation that Bloomberg actually uses that is standardized on Wall Street for enterprise value. And what I want to point out is how this is slightly different than what we've been using in our model. Matter of fact, what's different about this formula, and you can see here's the calculation for enterprise value, and here's the things that Bloomberg is adding up to get to the enterprise value. What's different between the definition we used in this class and the definition that Bloomberg and Wall Street is using for enterprise value based on that formula? Yeah. Well, we actually use debt and equity equals enterprise value. So we are adding debt and equity to get enterprise value. But then what are they doing here? Yeah. Are they subtracting out cash equivalents? They're subtracting cash. That's the difference. So in the real world, it's called net debt. Debt minus cash. What we do is we say <clears throat> operating plus non-operating equals enterprise value. Debt plus equity equals enterprise value. What Bloomberg is saying is debt plus equity minus cash equals enterprise value. What is cash on our Medigliani-Miller list? It's either a one or a two. <clears throat> Some is operating, but most of it, if you have a lot, would be excess. Here's the thing. In the real world, they don't differentiate between operating and non-operating cash. So in this case, if you got a lot of cash, <clears throat> it would be more like excess cash, which would be non-operating. When these formulas were originally developed, it all derives to Chicago in the mid-1970s, and when these formulas were adopted in the early 1980s, basically, companies had simpler balance sheets, which means the big non-operating item you had was cash. Joint ventures were random and rare. Today, joint ventures, equity in other companies, pretty common. 
Back then, far less common. So when the academics originally created these formulas with Wall Street, they said the biggest non-operating item is cash. So enterprise value, debt plus equity, minus cash, is what they defined as enterprise value. What is that close to what we would call a Medigliani Miller? Enterprise value minus non-operating assets. If cash is a proxy for your non-operating assets, what are you left with? Operating value. What we call operating value is much closer to what the real world calls enterprise value because they're assuming that all cash is non-operating which is actually a big assumption because you can't pay out all your cash, but they do. They assume that. And they're excluding the other non-operating assets. So that's actually why the key value driver formula works, because the key value driver formula equals operating value. And the real world proxies enterprise value for operating value. That's why you're taught free cash flow valuation is the valuation of a company, because free cash flow valuation equals the operating value, and the enterprise value that's calculated is close to an operating value, and you don't have to worry about the rest of the stuff, unless companies have significantly non-operating assets, which most companies historically did not. That's essentially where these standards have come from. So, in our models, on Wednesday, we're going to make an adjustment that has something called the Bloomberg equivalent enterprise value, right? And the reason why we're going to add that is because we want our models to calculate a multiple that looks similar to the ones on the list that we just created. And so we're going to adjust our model to look similar so we do multiples across companies. Our model will also help us do multiple across company analysis. But all that aside, what drives multiples are going to be six things. It's going to be growth and spread, so growth, ROIC, WAC, which are the key value drivers, and then it's going to be three more things. Tax rate, it's going to be capital structure, and it's going to be other non-operating items, joint ventures, et cetera, that are beyond excess cash. So essentially, those are the six things that we're going to use to understand these multiples and the differences using the formulas that were derived in the book from rearranging the key value driver equation. So that's the preview of where we're going. That's the fourth section of your group project. And that's the homework assignment that's going to be due a week for today. And again, we're going to practice in class on Wednesday. So make sure you have your template, have Excel, probably preview the book. See everybody on Wednesday.